Welcome to the Real Estate Niche Show, a show that focuses on top real estate professionals who specialize in different niches of real estate. My name is Ben Kogut. Join me as we dive deep into the professional and personal lives of the experts of the real estate industry. Welcome to the Real Estate Niche Show. I'm your host, Ben Kogut, and today we have Mason Borland. He is a vineyard syndicator, which is a very niche niche. Uh, he's raising capital for developing and operating wine grape vineyards in the high plains of Texas. His company, Texas Vine Country, focuses on large, scalable, and mechanized vineyard development. Mason, welcome on the Real Estate Niche Show. Is there anything that I missed in your bio there? Uh, just that, you know, Texas Tech happens to be probably the best school in the state of Texas. You know, I'm just going to throw that out there. But, you know, I, I, saw, I saw those that, horns. I, I saw those horns go up. Comment on that. <laughs> it's okay. Well, we We're not going to be in the same conference anymore. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, we can agree to disagree on that. Let's dive into it. I've never talked with anybody who is syndicating vineyards. I would love to know uh, what is it that you do and how did you get involved in this niche? Yeah, there's, I, I probably count on one hand, the amount of people that have, have done a, a syndicated vineyard. Uh, it's, it's not a whole lot of folks that, that work in that space. And, and, you know, even if you expand it to just ag in general, uh, or permanent ag, maybe two hands, I might be able to count everybody. It's, it's not a lot. And I know most of them. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, you know, my background uh, is actually as a biologist. So uh, trained as a herpetologist, environmental scientist type, uh, as I like to call it, professional rednecking, go out and uh, work on the interface between humans and wildlife and and, uh, and ecology um, and environmental consulting. So I've been doing that since um, 2012 uh, and same for real estate investing. So started in 12, uh, right as I graduated from Texas Tech University uh, out there in West Texas or out here in West Texas. So uh, rack them, guns up. There you um, go. Yeah, I guess go Cardinals now. Uh, Kingsbury's over there, but uh, <laughs> fail upward, right? That's the best way to fail. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, after after maybe seven or eight years of, of really going heavy into single family houses, uh, I invest with my brother and my dad. Uh, we really realized like, hey, this isn't scalable. Let's start looking at multifamily and commercial. And um, the first deal we did that was sort of more in line with that was buy a bunch of new build townhomes. So it was like a big package deal. Um, you know, we went and got commercial real estate financing, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, it's an investment loan, basically, uh, <laughs> very different from what we were used to doing. Um, and then we realized, hey, even this isn't very scalable, right? Let's go to multifamily. Let's do something big. Tried to bite off our first deal. <clears throat> I've talked about this bunch in, in other other podcasts and um, in, in some of the stuff I've written and it, it didn't work out very well. Uh, it, it ended up being one of those properties where it's uh, morally, I can't make money on it uh, to put in enough money to make it habitable and, and good for the tenants. Uh, I would make money and to leave it like it was and make money is not a moral thing to do. Uh, it was yeah. unsafe. Uh, and around that time is actually when I started uh, getting interested, uh, more interested in, in permanent agriculture. So looking at things that instead of planting them, uh, harvesting them, tilling it, planting it again every single year, stuff that you plant and you harvest every year, but it's the same plant. So orchards, vineyards, things like that. Uh, and really got interested in grapes because of just their ubiquitous nature. Nature, They're everywhere in the state of Texas. We have some of the highest density of like native diversity of grapes in the world uh, out here in the broader Southwest, but also in Texas specifically. Uh, and learned a lot about it because of that. And one of my friends was actually working for our now director of vineyard management and made that connection and just started learning as much as I could, as fast as I could, underwriting uh, and figuring out where are the holes in this industry? What are the problems? Uh, are there any ways that I can solve them with the experience I have? Got it. So uh, a lot to unpack there. So you through your through this journey, you you discovered that uh, vineyards there's a hole or a, an opportunity in this uh, industry, and so you decided that that was what you pursued. So you started learning. Um, you know, one of the questions that popped in my head, you know, I've been in Texas my whole life. When I think of wine, the only thing that pops in my head is Fredericksburg. 
frankly, uh, not West Texas, Odessa, and, or elsewhere. So I was not aware that there is a lot of grapes here in Texas. Um, why do you think that is? Is it just marketing that you know California and uh, gets gets that, or is there is there some other reason? Definitely two parts to that question is as far as the answer. So part A is uh, scale wise, you know, we, we may be the fifth largest wine producing state in the U S you know, you've got uh, California. Well, everything Oregon, is bigger Washington, in Texas. New York. So, yeah. Yeah. But you know, that's right. We've got tons of land, right? So why is that? If you look at California, they've got anywhere between nine, 900,000 and a million acres of vineyard. That's a lot of vineyard, Texas. Okay. We're pushing five to seven thousand acres. I mean, it's not even in the same ballpark, right? Got so, it. if you're looking at the scale, like, yeah, everybody's going to think of Napa, Sonoma, uh, Paso Robles, uh, even Fresno. You know, places like that as mm -hmm. as wine country, right? They're not going to think of Texas, but within Texas as a sub market, everybody thinks of Fredericksburg. That's uh, you know that Texas Hill Country, sort of the iconic wine country of Texas. Uh, and the dirty little secret about Texas wine is that 70 to 80%, even more some years is actually produced in the high plains of Texas. So between like Lubbock and where I'm at Midland, uh, that area there produces almost all the production that's in the state. Uh, and it's about half as much uh, cost wise to actually produce it there. But the scenery is not so great. So as far as selling wine, most of the wines actually sold in the hill country out of those tasting rooms. Okay. Good to know. I want to come uh, do some tasting out there next time I'm in uh, West Texas. So let's, uh, let's keep unpacking this a little bit. Uh, let's talk about, um, you know, what, 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 I'd like to know about capital raising, right? Because uh, clearly this is, um, you know, I'm in the, I raise capital for triple net syndications. We have cash flow on day one. That's clearly not the case with a vineyard. Um, and so how do you, how do you underwrite it? How do you raise capital? What's the time frame? Um, you know, that kind of thought process, maybe could you share about that? Yeah. So I, I guess to, to give you a frame of, of reference on where we're at, um, what we do generally speaking is, is a lot different from what other winery or a vineyard, sorry, do in the state of Texas. Um, our actual operation method is focused on mechanization. So, uh, for our typical size of a block or a unit, uh, is about a half a square mile. Uh, most vineyards in the state of Texas are like five to 50 acres. So we're looking at 320 at a time. So a lot bigger okay. scale uh, to run that in a traditionally trellis system. So the actual wire and post system that you use to support the grapes uh, takes a lot of manual labor. Um, so you're talking 40 to 60 people seasonally up to a hundred for something that size of a, of a half square mile. Uh, we use two to two to three people. Uh, so it's a, a big overhead difference, just a lot of upfront uh, investment. How is that? Uh, so basically, we do all of the cultural practices. So harvesting, pruning, spraying, deleafing, de suckering, uh, managing the, the floor of the vineyard, everything is done with tractors. Uh, so we don't actually have hands out there having to, you know, manually clip each, each vine. You have to prune every year, huge expense. Uh, we have a tractor that actually goes through and harvests everything. Uh, but just to give you sort of a, a frame of reference, that's our competitive edge, essentially, in this. We do everything at scale, repeatable, um, and we do it mechanized with low overhead per ton of grapes produced. So when, when we're underwriting something like this and raising money, it's a lot different, understandably, right, than, than, than traditional commercial property. You know, you're talking three years until your first uh, harvest, and it's probably not going to be economic. And, uh, you know, four years, you're maybe going to get up to 50% of yield. And on your fifth and sixth year, that's when you're really going to get up to 90 to 100% uh, stabilized yield, I suppose. But the big difference is you're looking at a project that can go, you know, 50, 100 years, add, basically add infinitum, and you can budget in to your underwriting, constant renewal, right? So you're doing replants. Uh, this is an investment that lasts a very long time. But to get investors, um, you really have to be competitive with other IRRs, right? So that, that return does have to be pretty good uh, because it's being shifted out in the future years. Got it. And so how far, a uh, couple of questions, how far along are you on your harvest or when did you plan? Where are you at now? And do you, um, do you just sell the grapes to other uh, brands or do you actually have your own brand as well? Yeah, that's our primary business is selling, selling grapes to wineries. 
Uh, so we're the raw material producer for them. Uh, basically selling the shovels to the miners. There's a lot of folks out there that are, you know, in the, the passion play side of things in the state of Texas, which is great for us. You know, we want lots of wineries and lots of labels, uh, but yeah. not really where our strength is. Uh, so we sell, sell the fruit uh, to the wineries. And then, um, so uh, what was your other question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I was, uh, I was curious how far along, like how many years ago did you start this profit? So we actually partnered up with a fam another family that has uh, already had some grapes as well uh, here locally. So they had uh, some additional ag land that we could convert uh, and they had some experience already. And Rusty was actually their vineyard manager, uh, our, our director of vineyard management. So it worked really well. Like they were the, actually the first ones to even try this system, this trellising system. Uh, it's called Highwire, what we use um, in the state of Texas. So they had their first 33 acres of it and they had about 28 acres of existing like premium traditional type, uh, grapes. And, uh, from there, uh, you know, those grapes are all mature, you know, they're, uh, over five years old. Uh, from there we expanded by about 290 acres on top of that, uh, during our partnership. And those are coming into their third year right now. Those, uh, uh, I'll call it high wire mark two, uh, so those are about to produce, uh, our first experimental block of high wire, uh, that our partners planted, uh, are coming into their fifth year now. So they're reaching full maturity. Uh, and then we're about to plant a, a new block here in a few months. Nice. Another sizable block I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. We actually found a, a really nice piece that's a, a little bit oversized for what we're doing. So we're leaving some room to expand in the future, but, uh, yeah, another about 290 acres of, uh, under vine. Awesome. And I'm assuming you syndicated that deal as well. Yep. That was a first, uh, true, like pure syndication, uh, vineyard deal that we've done. Amazing. Amazing. Are there any particular rules or regulations that come into play with these types of, um, businesses? Uh, not in the state of Texas, you know, you run, run into a lot of, uh, local and state level regulation in, uh, like say California, Oregon, and Washington, on where you can plant vineyards, what types of varieties you can use and things like that. Uh, but in Texas, like a lot of things, it's still kind of the wild west. So that's, that's actually really nice for innovation. You know, we can go out and plant whatever we want and figure out what really, really works well in our system, in our area, for our soil, things like that. Um, there are some, there, obviously once you get into the actual production of alcohol, there's a way more hair on that, you know, on the federal and state level. But as, as a farmer, we're essentially treated as a farmer, right? Like we have, you know, tax exempt status, uh, but we can still go depreciate all our, uh, you know, TPOs, fines, buildings, things like that. Uh, so it's, it's a nice hybrid between uh, being a farmer and doing commercial real estate. Got it. Uh, you know, just to the extent that you can share, like how, how do the numbers compare to other types of syndications? Do you have any idea? The, the IRRs are pretty similar. Um, so the, the stabilized cash on cash yield yearly is a lot higher than what you'd see in other stuff, you know, uh, say on like a, a typical multifamily syndication, just for like your, uh, run of the mill thing you'd see all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing maybe 8% cash on cash, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for something like this, we're seeing, you know, up above, uh, we're in the double digits, uh, you know, above 15, uh, up closer to 30, uh, annual cash on cash. Awesome. Do your uh, do you give your investors any uh, perks like wine or anything like that, or it's just a pure financial uh, play for them? No, no perks. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so you can come visit the vineyard anytime. It's it's nice because you actually have your wine that you can brag about, not just from one winery, but you're talking you know several wineries, several brands within each winery are all coming from your vineyard, which is really cool. Um, and also one of the things that we do, and, and this is, um, getting a little bit in prop popularity, I think is, uh, you know, when people do a refi, a lot of times on a commercial syndication like this, a lot of times people will refi the investors out of the deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what, what we do is we plan to do a refi, uh, say around year eight or nine, uh, when things are stabilized, uh, but we want to keep everybody in it. Uh, we want to have this be a legacy investment where people are really invested for generations to come. That's uh, that sounds wonderful. I feel like people that are listening right now are wondering, okay, how do I get in, involved in this? So the question is, um, do you have any more deals coming down the pipeline and go ahead and share with anybody if they wanted to learn about it, how could they learn about it? 
Yeah, we always try to, you know, we always try to keep our deal flow up, but unfortunately what we do is so seasonal, you know, we can only really plant for a couple, you know, several weeks during each year. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there are only so many hands uh, available to plant and that are experienced and trellis and things like that. So really we're limited to doing maybe one or two deals a year. Uh, So if this is some, something that people are interested in, they really need to to have their eyes and ears open and, and, you know, sign up on our, our website as opposed to, to see kind of what's going on. Um, you know, we do most of our raises as 506 Bs. So I can't, I can't go out and market this to just anybody. I've got to have a pre-existing relationship with you. So if this is something you're interested in, things like that, happy to talk. Um, that would probably be the best way. Yeah. So since you brought that up, what would, uh, and we'll put this in the show notes, uh, what would be a good way for someone to reach out to you? Uh, I'm a LinkedIn junkie. So LinkedIn is probably the best one. Uh, I'll respond to you pretty quick on LinkedIn. Uh, also on our website, uh, texasvinecountry.com. Uh, if you just hit the little contact us uh, form submission, that'll that'll sign you up for our uh, subscription list to keep you alert of what we're doing. There you go. So let's, I, I want to kind of go full circle back to how we started when you were talking about how you were looking for opportunities to, I guess, solve uh, a problem. And I'm wondering if you have discovered that maybe this is um, a business model that could apply to other types of crops or other types of businesses. Have you considered looking into that? Oh, 100%. I think um, the biggest competitive advantage I have as an investor is that I know how to do and how uh, many different industries operate. Uh, So one of my passions in life uh, is just being curious, right? I love to learn about uh, new and exciting things, whether it's uh, you know, figuring out how to rebuild a diesel engine or how do laundromats work? Uh, you know, what are the economics behind it? Or, you know, I'm just walking down the street and I see a donut shop, like figure out how the donut shop works. Like what are the economics behind it? How does it run? Who finances it? Where do you get financing? Things like that. Uh, and I think that's really important because um, what it does is it gives you more tools in your toolbox, right? So the more things that you at least have a structural understanding of, uh, when you're figuring out how the next thing works and you see a problem, you might already have that solution sitting in your back pocket that you can go plug in from somewhere else. Uh, and it's the same way with the vineyards. Uh, you know, for us, we saw uh, this is something that we can do much more efficiently at scale uh, uh, in, in a, you know, using syndication to get out in front of something that takes a long time to turn around, right? You, you know, if you're thinking, uh, five years to first production, I might not plant my next block from cash flow for 20 years, you know, like this could take a while. So it's, it's, it behooves you to speed that, that growth cycle up and catch up. Um, so, you know, for other crops, there are definitely um, the same issues of mechanization uh, where it could be the, the solution to some of those problems. Uh, and a lot of it is um, catching up to places like California. You see food prices going up, uh, labor is hard to get. Uh, that's mm-hmm. been the biggest uh, driver in the last really two years has been labor being hard to get. I, I, I'd be curious to know if there are any uh, technologies or AI or robotics that are going to start coming into play that could uh, mitigate that uh, issue that you're talking about. Oh, hundred percent. You know, John Deere just, uh, just released their new autonomous 8R tractor. And uh, while that one doesn't physically fit down our rows, uh, you know, when they have a, like a, uh, was it 6090 R that's, uh, you know, a skinny tractor that, that, uh, is autonomous that could save us, you know, potentially 30 to $50,000 a year. Uh, just nice. being able to say, Hey, tractor, go mow the roads and just send it right. And not have to have somebody sitting in it. And then we can have our, our foreman doing something else to save us a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, and things like that are definitely being pushed. It'll be a solution for a lot of things coming forward. Well, I, uh, I have a feeling that you're, you're going to be able to figure out a way how to seize those opportunities since uh, you're scaling up and you're, you're putting systems in place and uh, syndicating, which is like all these combined. I'm really super impressed with what you've been able to accomplish. So congrats on your successes so far. <laughs> Thanks. So let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit forward. I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about, uh, about you, Mason. Um, here's the question, um, professionally or personally, how do you like to invest in yourself? Uh, I really like to invest in myself kind of like we already talked about, right? My passion is just being curious about everything. I like to 
specifically take out time to learn about new topics and new uh, crafts and things like that. So, um, you know, my next, I think my next thing is probably to learn how to weld and do that well. Uh, so cool. just a, a new, a new skill. Uh, if I can take out time to, to do that, whether it's through reading or uh, learning it on YouTube, like everybody learns everything now, um, that that's really how I invest in myself. Awesome. Awesome. And how do you like to invest in the community? Uh, really through, through the church is, is my favorite. So, um, uh, Catholic, uh, and, uh, part of Knights of Columbus here, uh, locally and like to tithe and donate and donate my time through nights uh, and really give back here locally. Awesome. Awesome. And how do you define the word success? Oh man. So success to me, um, is definitely leaving a legacy for my children. Uh, so if, if I can leave them a legacy of, love and memories of me, uh, and lessons from me, uh, and stories from me, uh, and things that they did with me, that, that would be an absolute success, whether I, you know, completely fall in, uh, on my face business wise or not, I don't really care if my children, uh, feel like they had a great, great childhood and they, you know, remember me fondly, I will be very, very happy. Very good. Great definition of success. I have a feeling that that will, uh, that you are already successful and you will continue to be. And so, uh, to that point, are there, is there any other uh, words of wisdom or advice that you might have for our audience? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> probably, uh, if you have a lot of kids like I do, uh, your, your version of success may include them. How um, many kids? Uh, I have three going on four now. So, uh, oh, congrats. yeah, yeah. Between me and Rusty, we've got a whole uh, vineyard posse. He's got five. So <laughs> we're, we're, we've got the next generation, although mine are all girls. I'm not sure how fond they are of working out in the, uh, in the dust minus one of them, but we'll see. Uh, but yeah, your, your goals tend to shift. And, um, you know, one of the, the coolest things that I've found since I've had kids was really that, um, I value my time a lot more. And I think if, whether you do or you don't have kids, uh, it's really important that you value and, and account for every minute of your day that you can uh, very consciously uh, and make sure that you're spending them wisely because it's the most valuable thing you have beyond dollars. Well, on that note, thank you for spending your uh, valuable time with us here on the Real Estate Niche Show. Oh, man. Happy to. I, uh, I'm super impressed with the the niche, with the wine and the syndication and the way that you've been able to scale it and you're growing. And uh, I can't wait to see you continue to be successful on your journey. And I would encourage anybody that's interested to, to reach out to Mason and, and uh, you know, check out his syndications and, and jump on in. So on that note, uh, we're going to wrap it up and uh, Mason, thanks again. And we'll see you soon. Oh, thanks for having me, Ben. Pleasure. Okay. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Real Estate Niche Show. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from me or the show, you can follow me on Instagram at Ben Kogut and at the Real Estate Niche Show. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.